Ladies and gents, welcome to this week's GeoTalks Online. It's fantastic to see all of you in the audience. Thank you for joining us. And today we are very privileged to have James Mangal join us uh, from Carleton University all the way in Canada. Thank you for uh, waking up, I guess, a little bit early to, to give this talk, James. We appreciate it. And before we begin, let me just first of all thank uh, John Hancock's and the CCIC group for sponsoring these GeoTalks. And by way of introduction, tell you that James Mangal uh, did his MSc and his PhD degree at McGill University, uh, finishing in 1993. And then he worked as a postdoc in Germany, as well as at consulting companies in Quebec, uh, before joining the University of Toronto in 1999. Uh, he's worked on many different uh, magmatic uh, sulfide and chromatite deposits since 1996. Um, and he joined Carlton University in 2017, where he teaches primarily uh, topics related to mineral deposits. So Jim or James, it's fantastic to have you here. Thank you for joining us. And just for those people in the audience who are not familiar with uh, the Zoom webinar format, um, we won't be able to see you or hear you during the talk, but you can ask Jim questions at any point during the talk by typing them into the Q&A function and uh, Jim will answer them at the end of the talk, but you can also at the end of the talk, raise your hand and we'll then unmute you and you're free to ask questions then as well. Also remember that we do have a little bit of uh, virtual networking after the, after the talk has ended. So those of you who would like to stay on and, and chat and catch up, you're welcome to do that as well. Okay, so Jim, over to you. Uh, feel free to share your screen and we should be Good to go. You just need to unmute yourself. Uh, you're still muted. I'm going to ask to unmute you and see if that works. There. there. Yeah, I'm unmuted now. Okay. Then you just need to share your screen and we'll be good yeah. to go. Sharing. Good. Are we all good? You can hear me clearly? Hey, yeah. Thank you so much for agreeing to give this talk at, I don't know, I guess 8 o'clock in the morning, your side? No, no, it's 10.30 here. Oh, 10.30. So it's not so, <laughs> not so bad. Well, first, I'd, I'd really like to thank you for the opportunity to speak to all the people in, in Johannesburg so close to, to the Bushveld. I've never actually had this chance before, and I'm very grateful for it. <clears throat> um, I want to acknowledge Sam Robb. He was supposed to be giving part of the talk with me, but he's just taken a job in northwestern BC looking for epithermal gold. So uh, I'm on my own here. And of course, uh, my co-authors here who didn't make the the, uh, the bio, but our very important contributors are Yao Zhou Sen, who is the, uh, the postdoc who's working on our most recent paper. Uh, some of you have seen the preprint, Chris Jenkins, PhD student, uh, and of course, Sam, who uh, did this work with me more for fun than anything else. Jim, just, uh, I can't see your screen yet. Uh, probably means you oh. can't be shared. Um, I have. It's funny because I was, And again, I don't usually have this kind of trouble. It might be because it's a webinar. Can you see it now? Uh, you are, yes, and all you need to do is just to go full screen. And then go yeah, Perfect. before and it seemed to kick me out. Do you have it now? Um, it looks like it is loading up. There we go, I can see your talk. Okay, now. all Excellent. right. Thanks, over to you. So there was my cover slide, pretty picture of layering in the bush film. Um, and so my talk outline is here. Before I actually start talking about the Bushveld complex, I'm gonna briefly go over the background that I had uh, quite extensive background in doing field work on mafic, ultra mafic intrusions in other parts of the world, mostly in Canada. Uh, and then what I saw when I first went to the Bushveld 11 years ago, field observations and, and 
a first order hypothesis that I framed uh, really kind of hardly daring to think it, but thinking that it might actually be more consistent with what I saw than the, uh, the conventional viewpoint of a, a large magma chamber. And then I'll go through some ways that we've tried to test this hypothesis uh, using geochronology, using uh, modeling of heat flow and uh, <clears throat> modeling of diffusion and plagioclase and some thermodynamic modeling of the phase relations in, in igneous systems. And then I'll conclude with a, a discussion and, and some concluding statements. And I really want to stress from the beginning here that this is a hypothesis and I don't believe this hypothesis. I think it's very interesting and I think that there's a lot of evidence in support of it. And I know that it flies in the face of what a lot of other people would, would think is, is true. Uh, and I like to keep this in the framework of hypothesis testing instead of arguing, trying to convince people that I'm right and they're wrong. Before I went to the Bushveld, I, I did quite a bit of field work in Northern Quebec in the Labrador Trough and the Cape Smith Fold Belt, which you can see up here. Can you see my pointer? I assume you can. Um, yes, we can, we can see your pointer. Yeah. Labrador Trough, yeah. Cape Smith Fold Belt. These are paleoproterozoic fold and thrust belts uh, that were intruded by a large amount of uh, bloom-related magmas. And, and I saw things like this all the time when I was there. This, for example, is the Roberts Lake syncline. And there's this big layered sill here called the Lac Chonet sill. And there's another layered intrusion here called the Kayak Bay intrusion. And just briefly looking at this Lac Chonet sill, if you walk across this thing, it looks like a small layered intrusion. It's up to two kilometers thick and about uh, 15 kilometers long. But when you look at it very closely, you see these little screens of metasediment between some of the layers. Uh, and the more closely you look at it, the more you realize that it is actually a stack of cells that were emplaced and solidified sequentially, often following a, a, a weak point right in thermal aureole of the previous cell. So they end up being stacked very closely together. Uh, superficially look like a layered intrusion, but in reality, they're still sediment complex. Here's, I'll only show one other example, although there were, there were many. This is the, the basal portion of the Kayak Bay layered intrusion. Uh, it youngs to the southwest here. So this is the bottom, and then it youngs down here towards the southwest. The green is, is uh, layered mafic rocks. The, the purple is Hertzbergite, uh, and the blue is, is norite. Uh, and the, there's a lot that I could talk about here, but the main thing I want to show you is that here, when you get into the layered series, which continues for several kilometers to the north, to the southwest, uh, these are one kilometer squares, by the way, near the bottom of it, you see these screens of metasediment again, similar to what I showed you in the last slide. They're very discontinuous. You can trace this one for a few hundred meters and then you lose it and then you pick it up again here and then you don't see it at all after that. And there are several more. And the key point here is that if you walk across this system right here, you just see layered norites and gabbro norites, and you'd have no idea that this body is distinct from that one and separated from it by a pair of uh, intrusive contacts. <clears throat> so just this is a very quick background really to the kind of thinking that I had, the, the things I was used to seeing before I first went to South Africa that cell sediment complexes are common uh, and they sort of grade into layered intrusions as these screens between the cells become less distinct or are completely removed by whatever thermal erosion or, or different intrusive relations where one cell maybe intrudes into another. And these contacts between auto-intrusive sheets uh, are usually impossible to distinguish from ordinary layering within single sheets uh, once you lose that little bit of metasediment. <clears throat> Um, and the other thing is that the, the mafic and ultramafic cumulates that you find in these sheets that are formed in hypabyssal contacts that are only a few hundred meters thick can very closely resemble the ones that you find in large layered intrusions. Uh, that you can see ophitic or even poikilitic textures, uh, sort of granular millimetric cumulates with intracumulus material that's had time to crystallize into oikocrysts and so on. Uh, so, Part of the reason I'm showing you this is to acknowledge that I may have had some confirmation bias. But in fact, when I went to South Africa, I went basically as a geotourist and I went because I wanted to see something different. And I expected things to be very different. 
So I went in 2009 as basically as a geotourist after leaving a, a stint as chief geologist at Noron Resources. Um, none of the work I've done on the Bushveld had any particular funding source. I never got a grant to work on it. Uh, it was all done on a shoestring with money that I could divert from other projects. Uh, the Canada's NSERC discovery grant system is fairly generous that way that we can't divert money into different things that we're interested in. The only student who ever got funding to work on this was a one-year uh, master's student uh, by uh, Andrienko. Everything else uh, has been done uh, by people who are just curious, basically. Sam Robb's contribution paper that we published earlier this year on the thermal modeling he just did for fun, really, uh, starting as an undergraduate student and then continuing when he came here to Carleton to start a master's degree on a completely different subject. And uh, Yao also has been working for the last few months in his spare time on this mush and placement model that some of you have seen as a preprint, uh, but that's not his day job. He's working on other problems. Uh, and I stress that because I know that there's some sensitivity in, at, in Johannesburg to people flying in from outside and, and working on these projects and not allowing people in South Africa to share in the funding. And I'm kind of I, I want to point out here that I never really had any funding for this, and this has really been sort of a hobby and a side project for me from the very beginning. But uh, still, I apologize for not having involved local people in my work. I did get very important support in the field. Uh, Stuart McQuaid, especially at Bushveld Chrome, uh, took me in the field and, and uh, really opened a lot of doors for me. <laughs> Gordon Chunnett, then at Anglo, also gave me a lot of help. Uh, I was only there for a few weeks, but I put some, some pretty long days. I took a lot of samples, thousands of photographs. And since then, we've been collecting lithogy chemistry, thin section data, mineral chemistry. We've done the modeling and geochronology. So here's the Bushveld. I think most people listening know quite a bit about it, but very briefly, I'll review the geology. Uh, it's about 400 kilometers in diameter. It's a one of the classic examples of a layered mafic ultramafic intrusion, and it's divided into zones, uh, which are stratigraphic levels in the complex. Uh, starting uh, at the external zone here, the marginal zone, which are uh, interfingered sills and uh, host metasediments of the Victoria supergroup. Uh, and then we get into the lower zone, which are uh, layered ultramafic rocks, Hartsburgites, peroxonites. Uh, and then above them is the, the critical zone, which is defined by the occurrence within it of chromatite layers. And the lower critical zone, uh, basically below this thin black line, is ultramafic rocks with chromatite layers dispersed throughout it. And then the upper critical zone, which is between the black line and this little dotted red line, uh, is dominated by mafic rocks, uh, mostly norites. Uh, which also contain uh, ultramafic layers, peroxonite mostly, sometimes Hartsburgite, uh, associated with chromatite layers. And then above that, essentially at the same level as the Marensky Reef, which is this red dotted line, just above the Marensky Reef is the transition to the main zone, which is dominated by gabronorites. Uh, and above that is the upper zone, which is shown in light blue here, uh, which is uh, defined uh, essentially by the occurrence of uh, magnetite uh, cumulus phase uh, and it includes within it the, the, the magnetite magnetite layers which are one of the world's major sources of vanadium and the bushveld is important because it is it represents the world's largest repository of platinum uh, mostly within the marinsky reef and the ug2 which is at this scale almost exactly in the same place just below it uh, and it's also one of the dominant suppliers of chromium to the world uh, through the mining of all these chromatite layers in the, in the critical zone. It's generally regarded as a pile of crystals deposited like sediments, either in situ, like chemical sediments, or like clastic sediments as, as a rain of, of crystals from above within a single long-lived magma chamber. Uh, which experienced periodic recharge events uh, after which it would go through periods of fractional crystallization. And this kind of thinking lends itself to some basic expectations, which I had when I arrived in 2009. 
Uh, and let, one last thing to point out here, this little thing that I popped up at the bottom is a schematic cross section of the Bushveld, and it's actually a very thin sheet. This is about eight or nine kilometers thick, 400 kilometers wide, and it dips more steeply at the edges, probably less steeply and probably continuous through the middle. When I got to the Bushveld, I saw things that I didn't really expect given my expectations uh, of a fractional crystallization dominated system um, in a very large, slowly cool intrusion. The rocks that I saw were much like the ones that I was used to seeing in much smaller intrusions, just a few hundred meters thick, small grain sizes, uh, poikilitic textures, uh, nothing at all like the big plutons like the Lac Saint Jean anorthosite that I have spent time on with crystals as big as my thumb or even as big as footballs. The crystals are small. They look like the things we find in, in rapidly cooled intrusions. Uh, to my amazement, I saw anorthosites everywhere, cross-cutting everything else. Uh, I was quite surprised in the Cameron section. Uh, everywhere I looked, I, I saw uh, anorthosite where I didn't expect to see it with clearly discordant relationships. I saw xenoliths everywhere, probably autoliths for the most part, uh, and I saw wispy layering in rocks that I had thought should have had very well-ordered uh, layering, more like what you'd see in a snowfall or a pyroclastic airfall deposit with very neat parallel layering. I saw a cell sediment complex in the base, which contained rocks that looked just like the ones in the critical zone. Saw a very disordered layering of chromite and silicate minerals, uh, Schlieren in the marginal zone that, that spoke to me of emplacement of mushes. Uh, I saw a disordered layering on the meter to 100 kilometer scale, difficulty correlating across the complex, except for a few really outstanding marker horizons like the UG2 chromatite and the Marinsky Reef, and really wild variations in texture and composition. And one thing that really struck me was that. It's something like the UG2 has an orthocumulate texture with lots of obvious trapped liquid. Uh, and it's sitting between uh, norites with adcumulate textures, no trapped liquid at all. I wondered how that could happen. Uh, seeing a lot of evidence of minerals that are related to each other by paratectic melting reactions, like chromite and uh, orthopyroxene, or uh, orthopyroxene and olivine that you simply can't see uh, as a result of fractional crystallization but uh, you would expect to see uh, if mixtures of crystals at equilibrium come to rest together. Uh, Non-cotectic mineral modes are the rule, not the exception. And I saw what I thought were symmetric thermal aureoles, both above and below the UG2 chromatite plus peroxinite unit. I even saw pseudotachylite and thrust faults, which I didn't expect to see. So quickly showing what I mean by some of these things. On the, on the right is, what I consider to be chaotic variations in MG number. And I'm not sure whose diagram this is. I suspect it came from Grant Cawthorn and I apologize for not properly citing it. Uh, but I just wanna make the point that if you look at the variations in MG number through the, the lower zone uh, and the, sorry, the, the lower critical zone. Yeah, in the lower zone, um, it, it goes up and down and oscillates quite wildly. And you see a lot of trends gradual trends to higher MG number that is just not consistent with fractional crystallization. Uh, and of course, you can make a fractional crystallization model work if you really force it and you can twist it uh, into conformity with what you see, but it requires a lot of uh, extemporizing really on, on what might have happened. Uh, and on the left, I see uh, a number of drill holes, stratigraphic sections through uh, the, the critical zone, the lower lower and, and upper critical zone, mostly lower critical zone here. Uh, and if I see a, a suite of uh, offensive drill holes like this in, in Northern Quebec, I say to myself, I cannot correlate these, these layers. Uh, there's a broad correlation between ultramafic rocks at the bottom and, and perhaps more mafic rocks at the top, although there's, there's norite down here among the ultramafic rocks and there's ultramafic rocks up here uh, among the norites. But this is actually, uh, this is from a paper by Tony Nalder in 2009. Uh, and in fact, people do attempt to correlate all of these chromatites. And basically the correlations are done by recognizing something that looks familiar and then counting away from it. Uh, and it may be correct, 
I'm not saying that it's not right, but I'm saying that I find the, the reasoning behind this correlation a bit suspect, because if I saw this kind of suite of, of drill holes anywhere else, I would really hesitate to join up all of these, uh, for instance, MG3, MG3, MG3. Sometimes there's an MG4, sometimes you call that upper unit an upper MG. Um, it's, it's a bit arbitrary, and, and I think that unless somebody takes the time to document in some way that these things are actually connected in space, or that they're exactly the same age, I would hesitate to, uh, to believe in those correlations. And I'm not the first person to point that out. Uh, Schoon and Tigler pointed this out almost as soon as this naming convention was established uh, back in the 80s and 90s. <clears throat> Another question I have is how the compartments join up. The, the lower zone is, is made up of a number of, of compartments which are distributed around the complex, uh, like here and here and here. And the conventional view, sorry, is that they formed first. I don't have control over my screen here. I can't go back. That's unfortunate. Zoom is doing something funny to me. There we go. These things formed initially one here and one here, and then they grew and merged. It's hard to believe that they would grow at exactly the same stratigraphic horizon. If you have two cells that grow, Randomly, you'd expect them to interleaf like this and develop screens in between them. Look at the lower zone. Below the lower zone, you see norites and orthocytes and, and uh, peroxinites and even a thin layer of chromatite, which is separated from the main body of intrusion by a screen of sediments. And there's no magma chamber here, as you would call upon in, in the usual uh, way of thinking for the Bushveld. So clearly you can form a little bit of chromatite and these layered mafic and ultramafic rocks through processes that don't require the existence of the magma chamber. This is in our 2016 geochronology paper. On the left, these are our uh, uh, photographs of core through the UG2 sequence at the Motoqua mine. And, and just I want to focus quickly on what we see here. We've got peroxinite in the middle with the, uh, the, the chromatite somewhere inside of it, and it's flanked by uh, a northocyte, both bottom and top, and then it's got norite on either side of it. And the thing that struck me, you can see better here, um, at the base, we have the peroxinite sharp contact against the northocyte then the anorthosite grades downward through spotted leuconorite into a more normal looking norite. And at the top, you see exactly the same thing in mirror image. There's actually a little chromatite stringer here. Then you have anorthosite, spotted leuconorite, and then norite. And, and you, could, you could account for these anorthosites as being produced by partial melting of the norite. Uh, I don't have time to describe the phase relations in detail, but if you're familiar with this diagram, you'll know that if you melt a mixture of pyroxene and plagioclase at the eutectic, and the mixture starts out with an excess of plagioclase, then you'll wind up with nothing but plagioclase plus liquid after some amount of melting. Uh, and we've done experiments and uh, alpha melts modeling that tend to confirm this. And I've seen things like this elsewhere in the Cameron section, this, uh, this anorthocytic or leuconorite, which sits just above the MG2, uh, has got a thin anorthocyte on the base and on the top. So you could argue that these also were produced by partial melting of this guy by the injection of these peroxinites. So the first order hypothesis that I framed, seeing all these things that confused me, was that each unit, and when I say unit, I mean, let's say like the UG2, where you've got peroxinite, perhaps even some norite above it, uh, and uh, chromatite, this package of rocks I call the UG2 unit, or a, you can call this thing a macro layer. Uh, and I propose that each of these macro layers or units formed from a single batch of crystal rich magma that carried up to 30 or 40 percent in trained solids, which might include xenoliths, which are relatively easy to carry and it's something like that. It's got a bit of a yield strength. It's got, it's mushy. 
Uh, and we know that, that this sort of crystal load is quite easy for magmas to carry. There's no problem with things like that being mobile in the crust. Uh, when a magma like that transitions from vertical transport in a dike to horizontal transport, the crystals can be sedimented out uh, to produce a pile of mushy cumulates. Uh, and in that lateral transport process, we have experimental and, and sort of anecdotal experience that suggests that the crystals easily can sort themselves out to form monomineralic layers like chromatites and a lot of other variants with different modal proportions that are not cotectic proportions. And these mushes could be emplaced on the floors of large open sills. People sometimes call those basal flows or they could be emplaced into older mushy or nearly solidified cumulates as sills. And in this case, after the mush comes to rest, the roof might come down and squeeze out whatever liquid is left and the liquid could be ejected into the marginal zone to form the B1, B2 and B3 type magmas. So how can we test this hypothesis? Obviously it, it breaks some iconic ideas and it needs to be supported. So. One thing that I thought I would try was to enlist Sandra Camo at uh, Toronto to date some of these peroxinates. And they turn out to be quite easy to date because the peroxinates all have lots of quartz, K feldspar, biotite, and zircon in them. Whereas the norites, which you'd think would be more evolved and, and more zirconium rich, are actually mostly almost ad cumulate and typically don't have uh, any zircon. So we sampled the Turfontaine 3 hole, which is in the southwest, the, the west, the eastern end of the western bushveld. Orange is norites, upper critical zone. The blue is another sort of more uh, melanocratic norite. Uh, green here are peroxinites. And wherever there's a little cross here is where we took a sample that we were able to get uh, datable zircons from. So middle group two, middle group four, UG1, Chromatite, Marinsky Reef, and something from the main zone above what I thought was the Bastard Reef, but it was pretty hard to tell. It wasn't a very well developed Bastard Reef in this section. Uh, and we also dated the UG2. Uh, it was an honors thesis by uh, Yakun Liu, but we didn't include it in that paper because it would have been a different set of authors and he only did three fractions, so we left it out. This is what these things look like uh, an x ray map. The green is orthopyroxene. The dark blue is plagioclase, uh, post, obviously post cumulus plagioclase. There's some clinopyroxene here, K feldspar, quartz, albite, and some chromite sprinkled through here as well in non cotectic proportions with the pyroxene. This is what the zircon looks like. This is a backscattered electron image. This is cathodoluminescence of the same grain. And clearly you can see nice igneous textures. It's hanging out here in the interstices between the primary, uh, uh, sorry, ultramafic mineral assemblage, but it's hanging around with quartz and kite feldspar in the late crystallized intercumulus material. It was dated by Sander Camo using uh, chemical abrasion, isotope dilution, thermal ionization mass spectrometry. Uh, and what this involved was handpicking zircon from crushed samples, uh, collecting several grains together into a single fraction, and then doing chemical abrasion, which consists of heating it enough to melt the, uh, the, uh, oh, brain fart, the, the metamic domains. So then they could be etched away with HF and all that was left was nice clean non metamic uh, concordant zircon. So you get very nice dates when you do this. She uses the double spike earth time tracer uh, to try and uh, improve the precision of the dates. Lots of procedural stuff here that I won't read out to you. Um, and one thing I'd like to stress when you're talking about comparability of these dates with other people's dates, it's a little distressing that they don't match up perfectly with, for example, the Geneva group's dates. But I do take comfort from the fact that she would go back and date other fractions from the same samples as much as a couple of years apart and get matching ages. So even if people still have trouble even using earth time matching between different laboratories within the Jack Satterley lab, she's getting very consistent results, which gives me some comfort uh, in interpreting the results. Here are the results. These are, are uh, uh, 
uh, concardia plots. I won't really go through them in detail. You know what these things look like. Um, one thing to look at here is this MSWD statistic, which is nice and small in most cases, like 0 0.3, 0 0.68, 0 0.05 is very small. Some of them are larger, and I'll talk about that in a little more detail, because we really want to have some sense of how reliable these dates are and what exactly they represent. Uh, they're concordant, they're very precise. We're getting weighted mean ages with errors of, this is not 15 to 27, this is errors of 0.15 to 0.27 million years. So, uh, <clears throat> sorry, 15,000 years to 27,000 years. So we should be able to distinguish the ages of zircon crystallization within a single layer intrusion. This is the way, one way of looking at the results. You can plot uh, all the ages in each fraction against nothing, just line them up against each other and, and compare. And so in this example, our main zone sample, there's quite a large range of ages. These are two sigma error bars on the individual fractions. And that would lead you to think that there may not be a single population of zircons in this sample. Whereas in other groups uh, like these ones, they all overlap fairly well. And if you care, calculate the error on this uh, weighted mean, it's quite small. And you can get a, 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 a quantitative idea of how badly these things slope off by looking at the MSWD. Uh, if it's one, they're probably all the same age and any variations between them are due to random chance. Whereas if it's a lot more than one, there's probably multiple populations. So your zircons didn't all crystallize at the same time. Uh, and we explored this in, in uh, the appendix to our 2020 paper. Um, this, there's a lot going on in this diagram. And really, I just want to stress, for those of you who are interested in these things, you can look at it in more detail if you want. But the main point here is that if you, if you underestimated the precision of sorry, the error in your in each apparent age by as little as 10%, then all of these MSWDs would fall into acceptable ranges, uh, except for our main zone nori, which I think clearly does have multiple age populations within it. <laughs> you can look at an apparent age correction. We've been criticized for the way that we did the apparent age correction. Uh, Again, we don't have time to discuss this equation in detail, but basically, if you look here on the right, we're comparing the partition coefficient of thorium and uranium between minerals and liquids. Uh, and if their partition coefficients are, are different enough from each other in a certain way, you can get very large and unconstrained errors in the, in the age that you calculate. But fortunately for zircon, this partition coefficient ratio is always less than one. And if you calculate, the entire range of possible age corrections for the different behavior of thorium and uranium and zircon as it crystallizes, you find that the corrections are all very small relative to the error bars on each apparent age. So we can effectively ignore uh, any sort of quibbling about exactly how we calculated that uh, apparent age correction. And you can also see on here a different way of looking at the age difference between the middle group two. Uh, Peroxinite, which has all these ages down here, 2056.9, 2055.9, or the UG1, which is clustered up here uh, at an older age. I'll come back to the, the significance of those age differences when I sum up. When did the zircon crystallize? <clears throat> this is a plot of zirconium concentration in the melt for a model of uh, one of our peroxinites. So temperature, on the x-axis, zirconium concentration, and the zirconium concentration starts out low and it increases due to, uh, it's, because it's an incompatible element as other minerals are crystallizing, zirconium remains in the melt. And the zirconium solubility is shown by this green curve. <clears throat> uh, and so where these lines cross is where you'd expect zircon crystals to begin crystallizing. And it's around 900 degrees. You would think at 900 degrees, zircon should become a liquidous phase in the interstices of, of a, uh, a peroxinate <clears throat> in the critical zone. 
And we measured the zircon crystallization temperatures using the titanium and zircon method uh, by laser ablation on the same samples that we dated. So here are the dates with their error bars. Uh, and here are the uh, titanium and zircon temperatures. So they're around 800, 860. Uh, and with these ranges here, you can see that, for instance, the MG4 probably did start crystallizing zircon around 900 degrees. The lowest temperatures of zircon crystallization are including these error bars probably on the order of uh, 750 degrees. So we're right in this range as the model would predict. Uh, this is a phase diagram for that for the peroxinite that was drawn using alpha melts and it actually corresponds very closely to the phase diagram that people use for the hydrous biotite granite system except that we've got this extra orthopyroxene uh, and chrome spinel floating around in our system. <coughs> These contours here are uh, the uh, weight fraction of liquid in the system. So at around 1200 degrees, we've got around 40% uh, solids. By the time you get down to 1000 degrees, we've only got about 10%, uh, sorry, liquid, 40% liquid. Uh, down here, we're at about 10% uh, liquid. So this plausibly could be a mushy cumulate. Uh, then as it cools for a couple of hundred degrees, we've got something which is clearly very well centered together, and it has a small uh, volume fraction of melt among crystals that are all pretty tightly stuck together. If there's a little bit of H2O in the system, which you would expect, uh, then the solidus temperature is down here around 700 degrees. But once that rock reaches its solidus, the water vapor should escape. Water typically doesn't hang around in a fully crystallized uh, igneous rock. So then if you reheated that rock, you'd be looking at the dry solidus temperature, which is in the vicinity of 850 to 900 degrees, unless you add water back into it. <clears throat> so zircon grew during this temperature interval, <clears throat> as you'd expect if there was a bit of water in the system, uh, around the point where biotite comes in. Uh, on the phase diagram. So the summary of the results, <clears throat> I think that we can trust the dates as measures of the time when zircon crystallized in each rock. I think we can trust the differences between them. Uh, we have high reproducibility within the Jack Satterley lab. <clears throat> so if we assume that that's true, then we can conclude some of these other things. So zircon grew around 100 degrees above the solidus in rocks that were at very low melt fractions. Um, the Marinsky Reef age here is younger than the age of the main zone above it. Uh, and we can do some fancy statistics on that and conclude that there's an 85% chance that this is true. More telling, I think, this is the one result which is really important, I think, even if you don't buy any of the other age differences. The middle group two peroxinite has a 99.9%, .9%, that's a three sigma uh, error bound uh, of being younger than the UG2, which sits above it. <clears throat> uh, so it would appear that there's a young and downward sequence in the peroxinites that we actually dated, and that they're intruded into the norites, which must therefore be older than the peroxinites. Uh, Zay et al. published a younger age in the lower zone, but they also had younger ages for some of these upper units. So I'm hesitant to directly compare our data with theirs. <clears throat> so we modeled this. We wanted to know what would we expect to happen in a system like this uh, if we have these sequential emplacement of cells or if we have a single large magma chamber. How long would it take to cool and what would the thermal history of each point in that stratigraphic column be? So Sam wrote a program uh, using Crank-Nicholson method uh, to solve the 1D heat equation. Here's the heat equation. It's a partial differential equation. And note that the thermal conductivity is inside this first partial uh, and the thermal conductivity depends on temperature. So you can't pull it outside and you can't do a simple analytical solution to this. You really need a numerical method. 
uh, to tackle this. And the heat capacity appears over here, and it also depends strongly on temperature. Uh, using this Crank-Nicholson method, assuming that these things are constant at each time step, uh, you can get a very robust solution. You can completely avoid numerical instabilities if you just set your time step or your node spacing to be small enough. And here, Sam shows us a benchmark model. The dots are his numerical model compared to an analytical solution for a case where these uh, parameters are held constant. And you can see that his model does a pretty nice job. Uh, so we have some confidence that it works. So jumping into some results, this is a, a simulation of a, what we call the monolithic magma chamber. It's a single uh, eight kilometer thick pool of melt, which is allowed to cool down uh, after a series of pulsed injections over the first 77,000 years, following as closely as we could what Cawthorn and Walraven did long ago. Uh, and then after it reaches about 1200 degrees, we assume that convection ceases because it's getting too mushy. Uh, and then it cools by purely by conduction thereafter. And this diagram here, it shows time on this axis from zero million years elapsed time to two million years elapsed time, depth below the surface from zero to 15 kilometers, and temperature from zero to 1500 degrees C. So this little yellow box here is the 1200 degrees C, uh, eight kilometer thick Bushveld complex between a depth of, I guess that's uh, about three kilometers and 11 kilometers. I'm not sure exactly what depths you picked here. Uh, and then if you take a single plane through this, parallel to the screen along this back here, you're looking at the temperature distribution at the time when, when it began cooling after that first 77,000 years. And then if you take sections across here at any subsequent time, you're looking at the distribution of heat at different times. Or if you take a section this way, you're looking at the thermal evolution of a point in that system through time. Here now we're looking down on that with contoured temperature. We've got age along the top here or elapsed time on the bottom and depth from 3000 meters to 11,000 meters. So this is the temperature distribution within this hypothetical Bushveld complex. So it was, it was magma for the first 77,000 years, but by the end of that time, uh, it had completely uh, stopped convecting. And from here on, we have conductive cooling. And the temperatures here are shown in, in these different colors. So if you remember from that phase diagram, uh, we still have at least 10% melt in the system from like 900 degrees down to a 0% melt at 700. So this little domain in here, it's mushy. Intercumulus melt could be percolating around. Uh, and then below that point, it's effectively completely solid. And this hatched area is the, the the depth range and the time range when zircon would be crystallizing. And the entire critical zone should be crystallizing zircon at about the same time and the same temperature, according to a model like this, because the, the temperature profiles are very muted as this vast system slowly cools. And this almost one million year span of ages that we see is much too long to fit inside of that little box. This is a, a model that Sam ran for one possible sequence of multiple sill intrusions. And we really have to stress here, it's just one of an infinite variety of possible histories. And it's, it's done to show how things might be uh, and to show what sort of cooling history at each point in the system we might expect if the Bushfeld was assembled as a stack of sills through a longer time interval than this as a way of testing whether or not the dates that we have and some of the other ideas we put forward uh, could be consistent with this kind of cooling history. So he ran a two million year cooling history. He chose injection times to match with the available dates so that each zone that he in injected uh, would reach its uh, zircon crystallization age 
at the measured time. After 2 million years, the whole system is solid. There are a few things to point out here. So here is, is the, the, crit, the upper critical zone in our hypothetical situation. So, whoops, we intrude uh, a few hundred meters of, of norite. Uh, it cools very quickly because it's not very big. Uh, and by half a million years later, the whole system has cooled below its solidus. And then we start popping in some of these other things. Uh, a little bit of chromatite and peroxynite here and there, and then the main zone above it. And then other chromatites, peroxynites at different times. And then here uh, is the lower critical zone and the lower zone. And we're not wedded to these emplacement times. These are just hypotheticals. This is just an example of how something like this could evolve. And, and what it really, what I want to emphasize here is that if you break this thing up into smaller intrusive events separated in time from each other, each one basically has time to solidify before the next one comes along. So here is now looking down on that from above. The temperature is shown as colored contours now. This is depth again. This is elapsed time. Uh, and the uh, The zircon crystallization time is shown here again in the hatch. So here are our, our emplacement times for the upper critical zone, the UG1 unit, the MG4 unit, the main zone, and so on. So the main zone is emplaced at this time. <clears throat> it's a magma chamber for a short period of time. And then from then on, it's cooling as a mush. Zircon crystallizes in the interstices sometime later. And so we've got our main zone zircon crystallization age here near the end of its cooling history. Um, in this scenario, the blue field here shows what part of the system would have been, would have contained any amount of liquid at what time. So the upper critical zone would have only contained liquid, interstitial liquid for a short time. After the emplacement of the main zone and then the upper zone, we have this large domain uh, between about three and eight kilometers uh, of the system where there could be melt present. Uh, it's above the wet solidus. And then the lower critical zone, the lower zone also could have remained at least partially molten for quite a long time. But this part of the critical zone, uh, which had cooled below its solidus, may have remained melt free throughout this process unless water got back into it somehow. But anywhere that you're outside of this blue, the rock is completely solid. And anywhere that you're outside of these yellow domains, the system is effectively solid, a brittle solid, but it has some intercumulus liquid present. It's a porous melt, melt saturated solid. Here's a single cooling history Oh, I'm running out of time. I have one of these things, uh, which is in our paper, and, and you can go on and on about one of these things that really recapitulates what I was just saying about the, the other diagram. We have a pretty complicated cooling history here. Uh, zircon will only crystallize. In this case, we're looking at the UG2. A norite of the critical zone that was in place at early times would have this thermal history, it would be reheated when the UG2 came in and therefore could possibly be remelted on the edge of the UG2 to form those reaction in orthocytes. The UG2 itself would crystallize zircon as it passed through this zircon growth temperature interval. But then subsequent to that, um, even though it would retain some intercumulus melt, there probably wouldn't be any new zircon growth as the temperature never gets high enough to remelt or, or regrow any more zircon. And eventually it completely solidifies half a million years after it was first in place. Sam's done this for lots of the layers. You can look at these at your leisure if you want. He also modeled the, uh, the fusion of the plagioclase uh, components in zoned, obviously zoned crystals like these that you find in the critical zone. Uh, and to make a long story short, the, these solid black lines are the measured zoning profiles. 
the heavier black lines are the measured profiles. If you put that initial profile through the cooling history that was detailed here, so at least it becomes a little more muted, but it persists, it survives that thermal history. Whereas if it had the same thermal history as what you would get from the monolithic magma chamber model, all of these zoning patterns are completely erased by diffusion. So we wouldn't expect zoning to survive the monolithic cooling uh, history, but we would expect them to survive the sequential cell emplacement cooling history. So what do we conclude from all this modeling? We conclude that you could find what we saw in terms of the zircon ages and the sequence of rocks uh, if it formed as a stack of cells. That doesn't prove that it did happen, but it's consistent. This, we have an internally consistent set of ages and cooling histories. And, and that Cooling history seems not to be consistent with the, uh, the cooling history for the monolithic magma chamber is not consistent with the reported zircon ages. So they have to be wrong if the Bushfeld complex did form as a single uh, magma chamber that cooled as one cooling unit. Of course, the geochronology suggests out of sequence and placement of layers, which would necessitate that some of them are sills. After zircon crystallizes, it's always below its closure temperature, so we don't need to worry about resetting. Most of the complex was probably solid for most of its history. Even when there was melt present, it was just interstitial to a solid cumulate. Thermal aureoles around these sills are probably hot enough to melt the norite to produce these reaction anorthosites. Uh, and anorthite a diffusion in plagioclase suggests that you can't preserve these zone plagioclases unless you have these uh, this intermittent longer cooling history that we model. Now, skipping on quickly to the thermodynamics, this was presented in our 2016 paper, and then we've revisited in much more detail in a preprint you've probably seen, which has gone back to Nature Communications for a second round of reviews. Uh, the reviews were pretty positive and were quite hopeful that it'll be accepted. Basic point we want to make here is that in a fractional crystallization model, which is shown on the right here with time progressing from left to right, whether you got assimilation or not, you're forming crystals in infinitesimal quantities and removing them from the melt as they form. So your, your thermodynamically defined system always consists only of melt infinitesimal amount of solids in it. And when you do that, then that requires that your, your cumulate modes have to be dictated by the cotectic proportions. So you, it doesn't accommodate non-cotectic uh, cumulate piles. And it forbids the coexistence of mineral pairs that are related by paratectics. You cross the olivine orthopyroxene paratectic reaction, then your crystallizing assemblage switches instantly from olivine to orthopyroxene. In a fractional crystallization scenario, you simply can't have them both together in the same perennial textured cumulate. Same in most cases with chromite and orthopyroxene. Uh, and of course, if you've got a static magma chamber that's 99.99% liquid, it's hard to explain how these autoliths keep drifting in and they're very abundant. Uh, you can ex excuse a few roof blocks falling in, but it's hard to explain this incessant rain of of anorthosite and chromite autoliths that I see everywhere in the critical zone. Alternatively, you can use this scenario that we like to call ABC, assimilation batch crystallization, where the magma comes into the crust and in transit through the crust, it dissolves its host rock. And as it does so, it continuously produces uh, solids to remain at equilibrium. So it's dissolving something like granite or amphibolite, and it's producing an, orth, uh, an ultramafic cumulus assemblage of all of the olivine or pyroxene and chromite. And it can keep doing that until it's got 30 to 40% solids in it. And that's still a mobile and, and perfectly plausible uh, constitution for a magma. And then when that magma is in place the, in a, in a sill-like body, the crystals will tend to settle out. They may be sorted by, by this mushy lateral transport process, winnowing and so on. So you can get segregation of layers and a departure 
from uh, cotectic proportions in individual layers, even though the, the whole batch, what I would call a macro layer, uh, may well have had uh, cotectic mineral proportions. And we've explored this in agonizing detail in the still water in the peridotite zone, and shown that it works very well. So we've applied this to the Bushveld. Here's an example for the UG2 unit. Uh, this is alumina versus MGO. Uh, here's the composition of the upper crust, which is a plausible contaminant, and a parental liquid, which is a comatiite, uh, an alumina undepleted comatiite, which is kind of what you expect a plume magma to look like. And if you mix those in the right proportions, you get a bulk composition that looks like this. Uh, and if you segregate the solids from this isenthalpic mixing process, which we modeled in alpha melts, and it's fairly self-consistent model, if you take the solids, which are here, and the liquid, which is here, and sort them in different proportions, you can produce an orthocumulate textured material here, which is mostly solids, 75% solids and 25% liquid. And that model cumulate has the same composition as the weighted average composition of the whole UG2 unit at Turfontein. And you take about 25% solids and 75% liquid, and that composition is a pretty close match to a B1 marginal cell composition. So that's our story, basically. And you take this bulk material here and sort it by the processes I've mentioned, and you can produce chromatites and a variety of, of, of compositions like these blue squares. And you take the bounding norites here and partially melt them because they're sitting next to this hot uh, contaminated comatite, and you get anorthosites that look like these. The trace elements bear that story out very nicely. This is the comatite down here, the green, whoops. Uh, this upper crust is the contaminant, then you can produce a cumulate that looks like this and the B1 magma that looks like this, and they match very nicely, not only for all the major elements, but also for the trace elements. And we've done this now, Yao did this exhaustively for a whole lot of different layers in the, in the lower zone, the critical zone, and the main zone, and we can, we can achieve the same kind of fit to the models with very, very simple models of assimilation batch crystallization. Whereas the upper zone, actually lends itself very nicely to a classic view of fractional crystallization. You see this continuous decrease in anorthite content in plagioclase, in, in Mg number, in pyroxene, and so on, forestrite content of olivine, subject to some small reversals that are attributed to recharge events. So this really underscores my point here is that we're not opposed to fractional crystallization as a model. Uh, we're only opposed to forcing it into, shoehorning it into situation where it doesn't really seem to fit very well and where a different model actually could fit very nicely. The isotopes match also. So we can take all the existing isotope data and do the mass balance with the results of the alpha melts model using the actual isotope compositions of the plausible contaminants. And, and the rocks that have been measured match very nicely with our models. Uh, and this isn't being forced. This was done a posteriori, after all the alpha melts modeling was done to match the trace elements and the major elements, then Yao came along and looked at the isotopes and lo and behold, they matched beautifully. So here's the takeaway point. If you can get the major elements, the trace elements and the isotopes all to agree to a very simple thermodynamic model, uh, it's hard to dismiss it. This is, if you look at these plots as being slices through an n-dimensional compositional space, we're looking at dozens of chemical components, and they all fit the model with the same two N members uh, and the same uh, mixing proportions in a model which is actually constrained by an isenthalpic thermodynamic model. I, I don't want to take time to look at this. It's in the 2016 paper. We argued that it, it's plausible that these cells could be emplaced into pre existing cumulates with very remarkable parallelism because of the evolution of the thermal stresses in these rocks as they approach a completely solid state. So moving to the discussion and conclusions, uh, it's gonna take me more than one minute, but I really would appreciate if you can hang out for another four minutes or so to get through this. 
we've seen a lot of features that just don't match my expectation of a simple upward degrading sedimentation of crystals, such as mushy emplacement, presence of abundant autoliths, non-cotectic mineral assemblages, uh, mineral assemblages that don't match paratectic phase relations, and even possible heated upper contacts like the top of the UG2. If you believe the zircon dates, the duration of this cooling history is much too long to match the, uh, the cooling history from the monolithic magma chamber model. And we appear to have out of sequence emplacement of different layers. And we have plagioclase zoning that just couldn't survive the protracted cooling history that you see uh, in a monolithic magma chamber. So in response to my field observations, I proposed a hypothesis and contrary to some things people have accused me of, I thought of that first and then tested it second with geochronology. We didn't come up with this idea to explain some bad data in the geochron lab. The geochron data actually supported the suggestion I'd made and, and Sandra didn't even know which rocks she was dating. There's no way she could have influenced uh, the results that she got because she didn't know the stratigraphic sequence of the things that she was dating. We've used geospedometry and thermodynamic modeling to support these ideas. So do we have faith? No, I don't have faith in any of this. I accept that the, the zircon dates may be flawed for some reason that we can't think of, although we've applied every test we can think of to support them. And the models are just models. And even though I love modeling, I, I'm the first to tell anyone that models are always wrong in detail, but they can be used to assess the plausibility of our hypotheses. I think the balance of evidence favors our hypothesis, but I'd really like to see more data, especially more geochron data. Unfortunately, it's extremely expensive and I can't afford to do it anymore. And the other point that I'd like to stress here is that this, all the thermodynamic modeling and, and the field relations that we think, you know, like the, the, the reaction in orthocytes, all of that stuff doesn't depend on the geochronology. Uh, and I would still be very inclined to support this mush emplacement model, uh, even if we didn't have any dates to back it up. So skipping now to what this tells us about the overall emplacement history of the RLS, it might have contained a magma chamber as one imagines them normally uh, during the formation of the upper and upper main zone. But for most of the time, most of the RLS was almost completely solid. It was either mush or really more like a brittle solid with a bit of uh, interstitial liquid. And whenever intrusive events did occur, there'd be these transient sill-like mushy bodies that caused transient local heatings of their margins. And lastly, and I think this is very important, it leads to the last slide, the next slide, there's no reason to assume that these mushy intrusions have to be layers. They apparently are in the Bushveld complex, but they don't have to be. And so you could get high tenor PGE sulfide rock like the Marensky package, or high tenor PGE sulfide bearing rocks, you know, chromat uh, peroxinites with, with PGE in them, or chromatites deposited from mushy contaminated chromatiites in any geometric configuration you want. They don't need to be layered like the Eastern and Western Bushveld. So hint, the Platte Reef looks, I think many people would agree now that it looks like a rather messy and disorganized distal equivalent of the flat reef, which itself starts to look a lot like the, the sequence of Marinsky Reef in UG2. So going out of what we're used to seeing at the current level exposure in the Eastern and Western Bushveld, you probably saw more stuff like the flat reef. Another hint, the lactazeal complex in Ontario is composed of rocks that compositionally and texturally look just like the rocks that we see in the Bushveld, but they're not organized into neat layers. And Lactazeal, of course, is Canada's main uh, palladium deposit. Uh, it could be uh, take the Marinsky Reef and squish it into a ball or put it into a, a funny shaped conduit and you could get something that looks like the Lactazeal. Uh, the peridotite zone of the Stillwater complex, all the chromatites in the Ring of Fire, Sukinda and so on, these things look very much like the uh, uh, the Bushveld chromatites, except they're not organized into these beautiful continuous layers. So take away point, we should not assume that you need a large layered intrusion to find Marinsky reef type uh, PGE deposits. I think it opens up vast terrains 
all over the planet to exploration if we uh, don't force ourselves to look for huge layered intrusions when we're looking for these kinds of deposits. Here are the papers that this talk is based on. And uh, sorry, I'm five minutes over time. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll stop at this. Great. Jim, thank you very much. That was a really fascinating talk and really great to hear uh, some of the things you've been reading about in these papers over the last few years. So thank you very much. We had a fantastic audience, over 50 people just watching on Zoom. So I think um, there are many more also watching live on YouTube as well. So thanks once again. So I can already see one or two questions. I'm going to just remind folk that if you do want to ask a question, and I think James, James is willing to take some questions, um, just to put up your hand, there's a raise hand button at the bottom of your screen, and I can already see that Sue has done that. So would Sue, you would you like me to stop sharing, or I can't see anybody, but yeah, you won't you won't be able to see anyone whether you're sharing. No, okay. so maybe just suggest that you keep, you keep sharing because yeah, all right, they can skip around. By the way, I have many other pictures available here if people want to question some of my comments about autoliths and you know disordered layering and so on. I tried to arm myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think, Jim, your approach is really fantastic on hypothesis testing. And I think uh, let's try and uh, constructively think about ways that we can continue to hypothesis test in solving some of these problems. So Sue, I'm gonna, um, you've raised your hand. I'm gonna say allow to talk, Sue, and uh, you can unmute yourself. Okay, um, Lou is going to be speaking. Okay, can you hear us? Right. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, Jim, Jim, that was a really great talk. Uh, and I thank you so much for uh, saying so many things um, that I've concluded about things like the Bushveld complex for so many years since I was a little kid, such as uh, emplacement of mushes and uh, the, the, layered, the large layered intrusion as being basically a sill complex. And so uh, I'm really happy with all that. What, what I'm interested in is um, the compositions of melts. Now, at one point in your talk, you, you mentioned that some of these marginal sills that so many people have been taking as parental liquid or parental magma compositions are actually produced um, as residual liquids that get squirted out into the country rocks. I, I think that's what you said. That and is then, what I said. I beg your pardon? Sorry, yes, that is what I said. Okay, and then uh, at the end of the talk, you, you had that terrific uh, diagram of aluminum and magnesium in which uh, I, I wish I had a lot more time to look at it and I'm sure I'll get an opportunity at some point. Um, but you're starting with a chromatiite uh, melt and then you're doing all kinds of uh, contamination things, I guess, to, to give you things that, uh, that might approach some of these sill compositions. But you know, my, my interest in this is, is what is the range of parental melt compositions, not parental magma, or, or not the composition of the mush, the bulk mush that gets in, injected as cells, but what, what are the melts involved in, in producing all of these uh, different kinds of mushes and feldspar bearing ones and ultramafic ones and so on. So, um, you know, and then the, the question that follows after that is where, where do these melts come from? What kind of melting uh, of the mantle is required to, to give you all of these uh, different melts? And how can we work out a, a tectonic or a plume model or some kind of a physical model for how all of these different kinds of melts get injected into a, a single thing like the bush felt? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that. That could be another talk, but I'll try and, and just look at the sort of high level point. If you look at this diagram again, there, can you see that? Yes, I can. So this chromatiite is uh, it's kind of a random, not quite randomly selected chromatiite, but it's, it's one that was published, sorry, I forget the name of the author, but it's the one that I always use because it's, it seems to be un, uncontaminated. It looks like it came from a depleted mantle source and it has no uh, crustal 
uh, lithophile element signature. So you can take that as, as a generic mantle derived magma that would be produced at, at uh, moderately high pressure from a hot mantle source. And, you know, just as Morib is pretty much the same all over the world, I think that, that plume magmas typically they have the same working material to start with. And so we can argue that they'll probably be quite similar to each other. That's my justification for using that as a starting composition. And so on this diagram, uh, we've done a single stage batch mixing. So we took this crust, I think that was from Gao et al, but uh, Yao, Yao has redone this using local crust uh, estimate. You mix some of that with some of this to get a bulk. So that's a single step. Uh, it was 65% comatiate and 35% upper crust. And then that bulk composition using the isenthalpic uh, uh, assimilation model in, in alpha melts, that gives you a liquid composition and a solid composition and a proportion of those. So it, it, it just spits out a, a, a temperature and, and a distribution of solids and liquids. So there's the liquid that you're asking about. On this diagram, it, it plots with a fairly low magnesium concentration uh, and it's quite luminous. But if it's carrying some load of, of uh, pyroxenes, maybe a bit of chromite, then it would plot down here. Where? So England. moving on to what Yao did more recently, we've got, he's done this for a whole lot of different scenarios, always starting with the same comatiite and then picking different, uh, he's got three uh, crustal contaminants to choose from. He uses an upper crust, a middle crust, or a lower crust. And then in each case, by varying the proportions, he can, converge on, so here's an average uh, critical zone peroxinite, uh, and then next to it is his average critical zone norite. Where are you pointing? Can you wiggle your pointer a bit more? Can you see that now, upper left? Okay, yeah. got it, thanks. So each of these matching symbols is, uh, is a, an, an average of a group of rocks from part of the complex, uh, with a, a model, the, the model are, are, uh, are dotted lines. He didn't match the symbols the way I wanted him to, but you can still kind of see what he's done. So this pair here is, is model and, and actual average. And then we would explain the dispersal um, around that point as being due to crystal sorting. I don't, I don't know how well that answers your question. Okay, so... What, uh, what kind of melts are we talking about for the, um, the main zone and the upper zone? The upper zone, he gets by an assimilation fractional crystallization scenario in the lower crust, where the, the magma is actually passing through lower crust probably quite slowly, uh, and if you use a sort of a reactive transport type uh, model in your mind, you can, you, can, you can think of assimilation fractional crystallization as occurring by, by slow percolation of melt through the lower crust and progressive reaction of that melt with the crust. And, and the melt that, that he sees coming out of that and forming the feedstock to the upper and upper main zone is uh, essentially an andesite. Uh, it's a, or, you know, a ferrobasalt with quite high aluminum content. And I don't have the compositions here in this slide, but I could go and look for the, the tables in our preprint if you want, or you can look up that preprint afterwards. Uh, but it's, it's a magma that's fairly similar to one that was pr proposed, I think, by Tyner et al., just taking the average composition of the whole upper zone and then adding in a little bit of uh, lost felsic component. But this one actually gives a pretty nice match. The red line here, sorry, the black line is the, the crystallization path for the cumulates. And then using a trapped liquid shift, you can check the data pretty nicely. Okay, um, thanks. That's great. Awesome. Thanks, for the question, Lou. Um, thanks a bunch. I'm going to just, there's two written questions. So I'm going to read them out very quickly. Um, the first gem is from Chris Hatton, who, as a question that goes as follows. Before the bush belt, 
Are the pre-Bushveld sills not a sill sediment complex? Pictures of cross-cutting an orthosite, question mark. Uh-huh. Well, I don't know how old the sills are in the basement. Let's see if I can find some pictures. Got lots of pictures here. Sorry, we'll get there soon. It would be easier if I went out of, all right. So I don't know how old the sills are in, in, in the, below the complex. They, they certainly, if they're intruded in sediment, then by definition, they would be a sill sediment complex. Uh, they could be precursory or they could have formed afterwards. And, and I don't think that that's easy to tell until you do really detailed petrographic work on them. Where did I put those pictures? They disappear. I had a beautiful picture of my backpack sitting next to a, a little layered, uh, oh, they're, they're in the talk, sorry, that's at the beginning. I already showed you those pictures. This here, this is, this is below the bottom of the lower zone. If you walk up this hill here, that's all lower zone. And at the bottom of the hill, you can see a number of exposures of, of Hornfels metasediment. Is that, is that answering your question? I'm not sure. Uh, well, I'm not sure, Chris can ask another one or you can put up his hand and you can chat if he likes. Um, but I'll move on to the next question. This is from Glenn Nawir, one of our staff members. There's a brilliant presentation, love the hypothesis testing approach. One question, if we can find PGEs in both layered and unorganized magmatic rocks, what sort of geochemical mapping technique should be used to explore for, for potential mineralization? And are there signatures that can be linked back to the bulk composition to serve as proxies? Um, well, there's the usual toolkit, you know, of looking for PGE depletion and or or sort of sporadic PGE enrichment that would show that the system was sulfide saturated. I've, in my own exploration efforts, which I didn't really mention, but I've been working as a consultant off and on for the last 25 years. I've never found those tools to be of any use at all. <laughs> <laughs> what we actually do is we have prospectors bringing us rusty rock and then we figure out what it is afterwards. Or we do remote sensing uh, geophysical surveys and we look for things like conductors or, or big mag anomalies and we go in and prospect or drill them. And so the, the geochemical signatures are all sort of after the fact. But what signatures would I look for? Well, I'd look for something that looks like one of these norite complexes. Norite peroxinite complexes, they're quite common in the Archean and the Proterozoic. And, and I think most of them can easily be explained as the result of these kinds of contamination processes. And any time that, that a magma like that is assimilating crust, it certainly has the potential to become sulfide saturated. And if it does so with a very small amount of sulfide, as, as everyone knows, uh, the conditions are, are ripe for, for segregating some of that sulfide to make a nice deposit for PGEs. If you've got rather more sulfur in the system, then it might pool and form a base metal sulfide deposit. But if you're looking for something like lactazeal, well, you're looking for a cluster of these noritic to peroxinitic intrusions that are related to some major structural feature. The lactazeal complex and its sister uh, complexes are sitting on a, a major thrust fault, a crustal scale fault that's accompanied by a big change in the gravity signature suggesting to me that the crust has a different thickness on either side of that feature. Uh, so those are the kinds of things I'd look for. I'd look for a region where there are a lot of intrusions like this and then zero in on them with conventional tools. Okay, great. Um, I don't see any hands up. So just to remind everyone, if you do have any questions, just raise your hand by clicking on that button, button at the bottom. But in the meantime, I'm gonna ask a question that really fascinates me, Jim. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people, I guess, would would try to refute your hypothesis by saying that um, there are field relationships which show cross-cutting relationships into the layers that you 
the pose are intrusive. Um, and I think I have a, a mechanism by which that may happen that fits with your model, but I'm just wondering what your take on that is. Um, I've, I've had a real back and forth with, with a couple of my colleagues and since they're not here to defend themselves, I'm not gonna name them. It's, it's been a matter of contention for sure. Um, mm. Of course, I don't have the luxury of going back to do field checking. Um, I would point out a couple of things. One is that other people like Roger Schoon, for example, have been making the same sorts of arguments as this for a long time based on a real intimate familiarity with field relations. Um, so as a, almost as a bystander here, since I don't get to go back in the field often and look at things again, I would say it's a bit of a, uh, it almost seems like a matter of opinion. And I think a big part of the problem is that the contact relations are very poorly exposed in the Bushfeld. The kinds of things I showed you here at the beginning, everything colored on this plot is 100% exposed glacial outcrop. It's beautiful. You've got almost 100% exposure here and you can see things that you simply cannot see when you've got isolated outcrops like this surrounded by thorn bushes. And so there's a lot of room for argument. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that two groups of people whose, whose field experience and, and creds I have respect for can have divergent opinions about those same field relations, that suggests to, suggests to me that it's going to be really hard to use the field relations to come up with definitive answers. How's that? Yeah, I think, I mean, that's, that, that's, that's a, a good answer. I mean, one of the things that I, that I was referring to is that a lot of seismologists from here, here at WITS have been looking at um, you know, seismological profiles through the bush belt. And one of those cross-cutting um, relationships that, that people have used to refute your, your model is that of, of potholes. But it seems rather interestingly, and I think some of that work has been published, that some of the potholes are continuous or aligned over stratigraphy, which suggests that they may not be primary magmatic features, um, and they may actually be secondary features. So that's you know, one of the reasons I just wanted to bring that point up, because I think that there's still a lot of hypothesis testing we can do, even with some of those field relationships. Um, yeah. Um in, in what I've seen, and I did get a chance to see quite a lot of data. I've got lots of data from Motoquin Mine, for example, uh, because people shared information with me. I don't see evidence for that stratigraphic stacking, and it may be that coincidentally sometimes they're stacked, uh, but I, I, I couldn't find that evidence. Of course, I'd like to see it if it's there. Um, one of the most damning things that somebody could point to would be if a pothole in a supposedly older unit cuts through what I've suggested is a younger unit. But again, so far, I haven't actually seen an unequivocal case of that. Yeah, okay. And the people are arguing about these relationships and it seems to be hard to be sure. <clears throat> well, it's good to hear that there's still lots of hypothesis testing that can go on. <laughs> an intrusion like this that has been studied for so long. Um, but thank you very much once again. I don't see any. Oh, I do see some questions actually. Jim, do you have some time for a few more questions? Yeah, I've got, I've got all day. <laughs> <laughs> they actually aren't questions. There are two comments that say thank you for a great talk and uh, thanks for the good thoughts. So, um, yeah, thank you once again. We can thank okay. you um, some more. And we have an audience from around the world, I should point out, which is wonderful from America, North America, several people in Europe. And obviously lots from South Africa. So um, thank you once again. We really appreciate it. Okay. Well, um, I really I just, appreciate your your willingness to let me do this, and it's been fun actually. Great, great, that's wonderful. So I'm just very quickly going to share because we have a whole bunch of people that um, I don't think are on our mailing list. So I just want to share very briefly. Um, if you want to join our mailing list and listen to more of these fantastic talks, uh, you will see right now a little QR code which you can simply snap. And that will take you to a link to join the mailing list where um, we'll be able to watch these talks live every Thursday. 